The channel you're watching right now is called The Shieldery because I myself own a small business in which I mainly produce all kinds of medieval shields. And one of my favorite ones is the Pavese. And I think it's kind of underappreciated, so let's build one. Of course, only with authentic materials. <laughs> I'll make one exception, but I'll explain to you why later and I think you'll understand. The process will be the following. At first, we're gonna take a look at the piece we want to recreate in the museum. Then we're gonna construct a wooden core, add the layers of fabric, add the gesso and the different layers of paint. For you, it'll be like 20 minutes, for me, four weeks. <laughs> so I better get started. The Pavisi we're gonna recreate comes from Bohemia from around 1490. It measures 121 centimeters to 54. Currently it's at the Museum of Vienna that also provided those high resolution pictures. I put a link to them in the description. I already printed it out, whoops, <laughs> in the correct scale. It's a bit larger than I thought and I can't wait to see how it actually feels in my hands when it's finished. At first I transferred the general shape on some Bruce wood planks. Of course, don't forget the three centimeters overlap. I choose this kind of wood because you can see some glimpses coming through in the original at the bottom corners. I also made them more pointy because on other shields of this area and time, you can see that, well, they were more pointy. After cutting them out with a jigsaw, I laid them on top of each other to make sure that I didn't mismeasure. I had to wrap my head around the next step quite a bit because the nosy thing on top has kind of a strange shape. I started by cutting out the general shape with a chop saw. I'm quite experienced with this machine. I maybe would recommend to do it by hand for someone who, well, can't afford it or hasn't the experience. Then I used the edge grinder and a rasp blade to refine the shape. Because the surface was way too rough after that, I used a serrated washer to even it out. Now I have to hollow it out, but because I'm afraid I could break it whilst doing so, I first used a sew on the rims. Then I continued to chisel the mass out but I have to be very careful whilst doing so, especially on the bottom part. Now we are done with the most difficult wooden piece and um, I think it looks quite good. It's a bit blulup, not, not perfectly straight, but when you look at our reference, I think it's okay. And nobody will notice those little details anyway and it's handmade and it's okay when you can see that. So let's continue with the wooden planks now and one of my favorite toys, tools. I'm gonna keep that. Which of course is the electric planer, which also comes very handy when we have to create the angle at the connecting area between the planks. And we need an angle because we need, well, a curvature. For that, I mark the area with a black line. And I know I'm done with the black line starts to disappear. When I started with this strategy, I was really worried that what if the angle varies like a bit and blah, blah, blah. And so I bought this fancy tool, but actually you don't need it. Like one millimeter plus or minus over 30 centimeters doesn't make that much of a difference. The extra tool was like wasted money. But let's connect our planks now, of course, with authentic cheese glue. For that, I set casein with water overnight in a proportion of two to five. Then you add two thirds of the weight of the casein with swamp lime to the potion. And after mixing it for 30, 60 seconds, it becomes really, well, gluey. <laughs> but then we have to face another problem which bugged me for years because although we can clamp the planks together at the ends the shield is so long that they will stay apart at the middle. That's why we have to use a cheeky modern screw cheat code. They only temporary till the glue has dried. Don't worry. In the original dowels were used so let's not forget them. Mine have a diameter of 10 millimeters. And for the nose, a simple screw clamp does the trick. Two days have passed now, the glue has dried and I think the piece makes a pretty solid impression. So now we can continue by refining the shape. We'll start with the edge grinder on the inside to make it more roundish. <laughs> then we'll continue with the electrical planer on the sides to make them more straight and on the front side for a more even thickness. And we'll finish it off with the orbital sander. And I think now it's time for a montage, or as we say in Germany, Montagezeit. And I think that's beautiful. But don't forget to remove the screws first. And because the bottom edge was quite far off, I decided to use the jigsaw first.
the sawdust always gets everywhere. And as the idiot who I am, I put my mobile phone with the charging port upwards in my pocket. That means it's very, very dusty now and I should have taken better care of that. At least we are finally done with the edge grinder and can continue with the electric planer now to refine the edges and the surface. And come on, we have to admit, grinding down the dowels like that looks pretty satisfying. Some smaller inconveniences still have to be removed by hand because that's just way quicker and more precise. And after that, we can use our brand new orbital sander to even everything out as we wish, especially the edges, because if something's off there, it gets noticed every time. So let's continue with our next step in which we have to apply the fabric, which actually was quite costly woven if you take a look at the piece in the museum. That's why I'll use, well, this kind of fabric, which actually normally gets used in the garden to cover up plants in the winter. I actually didn't use it before. Normally I use much finer fabrics, so it's going to be a new experience for me. The glue I'm gonna use already gets heated behind me because that's gluten glue, skin glue to be precise, which definitely was used in the medieval ages and it's a temperature glue, so we need to heat it in a water bath. It shouldn't get hotter than 60 degrees though and when the gluten glue has reached the temperature of 50 degrees, it's ready to work with. The surface of our shield is quite strange to be honest. I will start at the top with the nose and as you can see um, it will be quite difficult to wrap the fabric around it. So to avoid that I have to move around all the other sides I'll start with that directly. When I craft something that complicated my mind constantly switches from oh that's so satisfying to crap fuck I messed up and this is like uh, every step at least twice. But at least I've got so much experience right now that putting on the fabric doesn't bother me anymore, especially if it's such a closely woven one. After I was done with the tip, I could massage all the irregularities evenly over the whole length. Okay, I'm done with the front side and as you can see the problem is that when the fabric gets wet it shrinks and especially at the middle part that could lead to that the fabric just pulls itself away from the inner point. I hope I managed that. Now I got to turn the piece around and repeat the same process on the back side. But we've got another problem because this fabric needs so much glue. Maybe I started with two less and then it would get difficult. So well, press your thumbs. <laughs> I waited this long to precisely cut the fabric because I wasn't sure how it would adapt to the difficult surface. At first I only tried to pull it over the tip by force because I thought it maybe could adapt, but later I had to cut it in some corners. Okay, we ran out of glue now, but at least we could manage the front side and I think it looks quite good. I've got like one or two spots where... Ba -ba -bum. What's that one? No. Uh, dang it. Did they vanish? Yeah, yeah okay, they vanished. I thought I had parts where the where the fabric went too far away from the wood and therefore wouldn't stick to it. But it seems like everything went well now. But we have to hurry up uh, and therefore we need more glue. And how do we do that? Well, <sighs> uh. And now we have to wait for a few hours till the glue has soaked in all the water 
and then we can reheat it again. And if that now should take too long, then the fabric on the front side would also uh, would already have dried so much that it well shrinks again and then it would deform our wood corpus and we don't want to do that. It's past midnight, <laughs> the glue has finally absorbed the water because I kept it at a temperature of around 40 degrees. I found the spots again where it's not properly sealed on the front side. So I'll show you how I discovered them again because that's very important and it's not it's nothing you can see, you have to hear it. Uh, wait in a moment. But the other good thing about the timing is, besides that it's Friday night, <laughs> is that I only have to do very little on the back side and therefore I can show you the technique in detail. While the glue is sitting up behind me, I can show you how I discovered where I didn't glue the fabric properly. Okay, let me bring you a bit closer. I need my microphone for that. Normally it should sound like that. And on wrong spots you can see there's basically no difference in the optics, but it sounds like this. Yeah, and especially, especially if you're using something like rawhide, you have no chance of seeing whether there's a spot of air underneath it, because like one millimeter can make a difference and you possibly can't spot that. But you can hear it just by tapping on it. I'll try to fix that now by applying more glue on these spots, because when you look at the reflection, it doesn't look like there's enough glue. I hope that will solve the problem, otherwise I'll have to let it dry and then have to take care of it. But that's also a very nice technique and if I can't show you this time, I'll do it on the next tutorial on a smaller, way smaller Pavese, like the Schongauer Pavese. I like that very much, it's just beautiful. <sighs> but let's finish that first. With a bit of force, I could stretch the axis onto the planes. The closely woven threads helped with that. Because the fabric shrinks when it gets wet, it gets pulled out of the gaps towards the ridges to shorten the distance like, like that. Yeah, you can hear it. Um, to avoid that, we push more fabric towards those areas. And this actually was done on the original too, as I just discovered by taking a closer look at the piece of the museum. Because near the handles, you can see a fold that only can happen when they push too much fabric at that area. Well, I want to avoid that though, but let's see, maybe on one spot it will happen either way. So uh, come a bit closer. The large fabrics helped a lot here because they are way easier to grip. To be honest, I didn't expect that because with like rawhide or finer woven fabrics, this would be much more difficult. On the other hand, because it's so thick, I had to speed up the drying process. I put the pavisi on top of the radiator, but the sunlight shouldn't hit it directly because otherwise the glue could liquefy again. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it has dried now and I think it looks beautiful. I'm really hyped right now and now it's time for the primer. For that we'll also need skin glue and when it has melted, we'll mix it one to one with the chalk of Bologna. The chalk of Bologna itself consists out of chalk of the champagne and aniline uh, in even parts. I use that special stuff because it's a bit more resistant for scratches. But till that happened, we'll have to do something else, which is to deburr the edges. Because of the coarsely woven fabric, we've got some ugly spikes. There it is. Can you see it? <laughs> of course you can't because I didn't see it either. But that is like a needle here. Let me give you a demonstration. The solution is just to use a box cutter knife. Yeah. And we also have to look out for spots where the fabric doesn't touch our wooden surface. We do that again by the acoustics. Do you hear that? Here is air underneath. But because it's so closely woven, I think the base coat will penetrate that and close the gap off. If it would be a larger one though, I would like open it with an axe. 
then peel the pieces back, add glue and then press it together again. But I think with this we don't need to do that. While adding the chalk we need a special technique because otherwise clumps and therefore air bubbles could form and we really really need to avoid that. We only add thin layers because the chalk has to absorb the liquid, the glue, before it falls down. Now I demonstrate to you how it looks like if you do it wrong. As you can see it doesn't absorb the glue fast enough and therefore just falls down. And yeah, bubbles are coming up. Those bubbles will form pore-like holes in the base coat and on 50% of the cases the paint can't fill them. Because my scale went out, I have to rely on another method of measuring how much chalk is enough. Here you can see that an island formed. You know, it'll go down like in one minute and we need the time to reheat it to 40 degrees again, so it's no problem. Because I had some ugly but small air bubbles beneath the fabric in two spots, I just cut it off. But don't worry because the base coat will fill it up and you won't be able to see it afterwards. Ah, oh, here we are at a satisfying moment again. As you can see I had to go for two layers of base coat on the back. Actually I just wanted to use one because as you can see on the museum piece the fabric shines through a lot on the back side. So I thought one layer would be perfect but unfortunately those small holes were left so I had to cover them up again with a second layer. Well they are dried now but before we can now start to base coat the front we have to apply the fittings and we have to do that in that order because Imagine this nail would come through from the other side. Then a bit of the base coat would crack off or could crack off. And we want to avoid that because that would make the painting process much more difficult and it wouldn't look that beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, the fittings basically consist out of two components. The first one are those beautiful staples. They were handsmithed by a good friend of mine and I'll put a link to his shop in the description. The second one are ox tendons. I already let them soak in water overnight because otherwise they would be way too stiff. You can buy them in pet shops because sometimes they get sold for dogs as toys. I tried to use two for the reef before but they were way too big. So I decided to split one but it's still very hard to do. It took me like 10 minutes to split the ox tendon with a lot of force and a box cutter knife. As you can see in the original there were two nails at the bottom. I think there was a grip in between them so I added one also made out of ox tendons. In order to avoid the tendons from deforming, I kept the wooden piece in the back. As you can see a bit of wood and fabric got split off and that's what I meant before. Because if you already had applied the base coat too, it also would have broken off and now we can just fill it up. I had to use 5 layers for that and it took so long to dry if I only would have had something to do in that time, but I just had no idea. I also cleaned it off with the back of a box cutter knife just to make the edges more sharp. If you think we are done with the most difficult parts, oh boy. Because <laughs> now it's time to paint but I'm already quite hyped because I think it just looks beautiful. And you know this is the canvas I dream of at night. <laughs> it's just so beautiful, so many options and stuff. And now I can see it coming together finally. So let's take a look at the description of the museum. You can see that egg tempera was used. But of course there are many different types of egg tempera. But and here we are the pigments again. The azurite I mentioned before. When it comes in touch with oil it gets green first and then brown. And you know azurite that's the blue one. This would be very very ugly. And that's why I think they used egg tempera without oil. So just the pure tempera. Of course there are still many methods and I haven't worked with egg tempera for a long time. So I think I'll do a warm up first on the back side. For that we will use a brown ochre from Germany. And you know this Pavisi was forged in Bohemia. So yeah it's very plausible. <laughs> So let's turn that shit uh, shield around. I added that piece of wood because it would keep the rest in place while it dries. Oh, come on, okay. You see it shrink quite a lot. 
it moves a bit too much for my taste but maybe that'll change when we add the varnish at the end and otherwise maybe like one more nail here <sighs> At first I experimented how much egg white I could use. And for the back like a whole egg did the job pretty well. Just the consistency was a bit off. Don't worry, just wait for a few minutes until I figured out how to do it properly and perfectly again. Then I'll show you how to make the egg tempera. And you can also see that another problem occurred because the handle is a bit wiggly and I'm afraid that could break off easily. So I think I'll just add a second nail. It's not perfect, but I don't want the shield to break because of this small stuff. Because the brown was a bit too dark for my taste, I added another layer of Italian golden ochre. It's so satisfying to mix paint, it's, uh, I can't get enough of it. The back is painted now, but I'm afraid I'll run out of egg pretty soon. So I'll just head to the shop while that dries. Here you can see what I wanted to avoid, which is the top of the nail shining through and the holes around it. But yeah, well, be it as it is. I refined the process. First, you need a few pieces of toilet paper. Then you crack open the egg. Separate the yolk from the egg white. Then you put the yolk on some pieces of toilet paper. And as soon as you notice that it doesn't move anymore, then you move it to one of the edges and open it with a box cutter knife. And because the skin of the yolk has already dried, it won't move by itself anymore. Now we finally got enough glue for our pigments I told you so much about. And here they are. We'll unwrap them in a second. Just a big shout out to my Patreons. Thank you. I'll put your name somewhere on the screen. I don't know where I have uh, space on the frame yet. Without them, this tutorial wouldn't have published for like another two or three months because I had to spend, uh, among other things, 180 euro only on the pigments for this process. So if you want to join them or give a donation via PayPal, you can see the link in the description. And please don't forget to share, like and subscribe. Let's continue. A bit of skin glue for the next project. And where are they? All my pigments, by the way, are from Creamer Pigments, which I only can recommend highly. They've got an excellent support for the, they've got an excellent customer support. And their pigments come at a very reasonable price. The two expensive pigments we're gonna use are Cinnabar and azurite and cinnabar is highly toxic so i think i wear some breath protection one of the main problems we're gonna have are with azurite because it doesn't cover the surface that even and therefore we would we would have some white shining through that's why we have to lay a base coat with green and for that i'll use a mixture of those two and i love them very much unfortunately i can't use them with acrylic but for egg tempera, they are perfect. I love those greens. But before we can start mixing our paint again, we have to transfer our motive. For that purpose, I'll use this carbon copy paper. The trick here is that if I like press here, you can see it gets transferred. So let's just put the carbon copy paper beneath our print. I didn't copy the shingles or the white ornaments on the side because I think they wouldn't be visible through the base coats. Of course, there were some holes in the model. You know, 500 years don't pass unnoticed, but I just could fill them in. I took a look at another shield with the same motive, but after giving it another look, I'm afraid it's a fake. Because I wanted to figure out how covering the cinnabar pigment is, I gave it a quick test. Now it's time for the green. Ah, oh, so beautiful.
you also think that all the advanced art tools add kind of a nice contrast to my workbench? The motif, by the way, depicts the armor Christi, which consists out of the thorn crown, the lance his heart was pierced while he was being crucified, and the thing on the other stick is a sponge. Out of that, he could suck the vinegar water he was given to by a Roman soldier. Fun fact, vinegar water actually was a common drink amongst Roman soldiers because it purified the water and killed possible harmful bacteria. I'll add the black lines when we add the seams later, but for now we have to start with the blue. But we don't only need the azurite for the background, but also as a base coat for the letters, for the shadows of the thorns, and partly in the tip of the spear. I really, really hope that I bought enough. <laughs> the structure of the azurite pigment is entirely different to the other ones, who basically are clayish. The azurite is au contraire quite crystal-like. You could think that the paint changes color, but actually the azurite pigments are so heavy that they just sink down. So you have to stir it up after some time, or well, you also could just press your paintbrush strong enough to the surface that it also could take the pigment. My back. When mixing the pigments, you have to take a close look of the different densities of the pigments. Because as I said before, the azurite pigment is quite heavy, but the bone black is quite light in comparison. That's why you have to take care that you don't only scrap the light ones from the top or the blue heavy ones from the bottom of the paint. That's why you have to blend it a bit with every stroke with your paintbrush. Also, if you would apply it too thick, it would get separated on the canvas itself. Okay, this is day two of the paint job and I already thought I'd be finished by now. Uh, we still got a lot to do and it's like six hours later than I started yesterday because I went to university and in addition my back hurts really bad. I feel like an old man. And additionally I discovered another feature because in the original there were shadows on the edge here around the thorn crone and next to the staffs and of course the letters too. <laughs> And another problem is that I've got a nice event this weekend and I wanted to carry it. But if I don't finish it today, the varnish wouldn't be able to dry in time. It would be such a nice revealing shot. I really want to do it, but I really need to finish this today. And with today, I mean until I go to bed. <laughs> today, we'll start with a red paint and then we'll copy with the black carbon copy paper the rest of, of our image to the shield and then we'll hopefully finish soon. This is the highly toxic cinnabar pigment I talked about before. The red is just awesome, but yeah, well, it's a bit dangerous, I suppose. And I, as a producer, am interested whether that would influence your chances of buying that piece. It's more authentic, but yeah, well, contains poison, I guess. Let me know in the comments, please. Ah, yeah, by the way, I nearly forgot it. The next pigment I'm gonna use is white and I'll use the modern titanium white. In the original, lead white was used now. And this pigment would be even more like a lot more poisonous. And that's why I decided to go with the modern titanium white. What do you think about that decision? That's the like only big component I'd say I use that's not authentic medieval. When it comes to the white ornaments on the edge strips, I didn't try to imitate the exact shape, but more the technique. Cause you can see it's quite fuzzy and seems like it was done very quickly. In order to do that, I had to figure out which brush was used. At first I thought it was a fan blender brush, but that was not precise enough. Because of that, I switched to a flat brush, but that was too precise. And then I suddenly realized it was a normal bristle brush. Ah, crap, where did the tip go? I cut it off when we started copying the printout because then it was easier to place. Maybe you were afraid of painting the shingles or scales, I don't know. But first, if you use the correct brush, which is of course a script liner, you won't have to dip it so often. And second, they were done very quickly and not precise, so we don't have to do it either. I noticed in the pattern that they didn't were painted at all next to the spear. I think that was done for the sake of the shadow. 
Uh, and that's how you synchronize audio on the construction site. Uh, well, we only have one step left now. It's already nearly like past midnight and we need to outline the red parts with an even darker red for which I will use Venetian red earth pigment. I already told you it's late. Come on people. <laughs> but because egg tempera is not very water resistant, we'll need to apply a oil varnish. For that we'll either use like normal linen oil like it would probably would have been used in the medieval ages but it would take three months to dry or linen oil varnish but that turns a bit yellow quite fast and it's not that water resistant so I think my choice will go with a more modern solution which is hard drying oil and you know that that sounds completely off topic for you maybe if you if you want to do it historic correct but this kind of varnish gets used in museums to preserve authentic pieces like that. And uh, you know, I don't want to pat myself on the shoulder too much. And yeah, I think I'm pretty awesome right now. There's another small chemical problem I need to discuss because azurite, uh, the blue we used, is a copper mineral and it could decompose when it gets in touch with oil for too long into malachite, which is also a copper mineral but a green one and then it could decompose even further and turn brown and that would be very ugly. Originally I wanted to risk it because I think the egg tempera covers the pigment completely but in theory, at the top, the top layer could be so thin that, yeah, well, it would, could turn green. And I think I'll go for sure because I put my heart and soul into it and just add a very, very, very thin layer of egg yolk. It was in this moment he noticed he fucked up because the protective layer liquefied the paint after like two strokes and the third one smudged the whole job. I immediately tried to tap it off with a bit of toilet paper, but the damage was done. Yeah, well, be it as it is, if you don't know it, you won't see it, I hope. But after that, it was finally time for the finish and the hard drying oil. And now enjoy the final result. The castle in the background, by the way, is the beautiful Kadelsburg near Nuremberg. See you in the next video then.